I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicle, a 10,000 year odyssey. And today, we're not going all the way back 10,000 years, which is what we do sometimes. But today, we are going to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a long way from Hawaii. And just to be honest about that, Trying to find North Carolina from here is quite a void. However, with the magic of digital everything, we will visit with Rick Rainbow. Rainbolt? Rick? Yes. Rick Rainbolt? Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Rick has an interesting, interesting uh, venture, and that is Hemp Geo Institute, where he grows and teaches and all of those things about industrial hemp, which is what we need to learn about. So, Rick, tell us all about Rick. <laughs> Uh, we only have a few minutes, but uh, <laughs> okay. I'll just give you a a thirty second uh, you know background. Um, in January of two seventeen um, is when I founded Hemp Geo Institute here in North Carolina. Prior to that, I was a small investor in the cannabis industry for a couple of years, and that's kind of where I started getting my introduction. Um, into the cannabis industry, um, building a lot of relationships, networking. And then in 2016, North Carolina, we passed the laws, and we knew that 2017 would be the first year that, uh, after more than 80 years, North Carolina could once again start growing industrial hemp. And so I founded Hemp Geo Institute in January of. 2017, and we began our business by putting on educational symposiums. And one of the things that we did that was a good move is we brought a whole lot of smart people in from Oregon and Colorado from the relationships that I had built in the previous two years. And they were the educators and the teachers at our symposium. And since then, we've had uh, nine educational training programs uh, around the country. And then in June of 2017, about six months after we started the company, we started our consulting division. And what we did, we partnered with people interested in getting into the, on the growth side, we partnered with them to help them build grow operations, help them become very successful. And from that point, June of 2017 until today, we've, we've built 22 grow operations, and we have five under construction as we speak right now. So that's just kind of a little 30-second, <laughs> you know, background of um, where we started and, and where we're at. Wow. Now, what do you mean by a grow operation? What is a grow operation? Well, there's a lot of ways to get into this industry. Um, a lot of people assume the best way is to get it into the, you know, the growing side. But it's, that's, that's one path. Uh, I chose the educational path. Uh, there's such a huge thirst and a huge demand for, for education. And the demand way far exceeds, you know, what's available. It's really good, you know, good consultants that have, you know, long histories of success in growing this incredible, beautiful plant. And, uh, you know, but, but there's a lot of ways you can get into it. Uh, we chose the educational path to help those people that decided to get on, in on the growth side um, of this industry. So once we decided to be on the educational, we wanted to niche, become a niche within the industry. and. When people get into this industry and we consult with them, there's two sides of the coin, we tell them, that 
you can you can begin by getting involved on the biomass side. And and look, let's break this first step one, two, three. Let me go through a one, two, three. If you get into this industry, you can get in on the fiber side. You can get in on the seed side, and seeds are there's two categories under seeds. So one is fiber. The next is seeds. Under seeds, you can get into the food like the hemp hearts, okay? Um, or you can get in on the genetic side. That's where you're growing seeds, you're selling seeds to farmers to plant in their greenhouses or out in the fields. So we have the fiber, we have the seed. There's food and genetics under seed. And the third category is the CBD or the cannabis, you know, growing for the oil, growing for the medicinal side of this industry. Well, the reality is the majority of the money, probably 99% of the people are jumping in on the cannabinoid side because that's where the, the money is. Right, <laughs> of course, yes. So, so but, but, for us, it was, it was easy to choose, you know, we're gonna go, we're gonna go for oil, go on the cannabinoid side. Now, when you look at the, cannabinoid growing for oil, CBD, CBG, there's 88, uh, you know, there's, there's a ton of cannabinoids in this incredible plant. So what we, we chose to do, we believe there's two sides of that coin. You can go in on the biomass side, or you can go into what we call a craft hop cut grow operation. And I'd like to add one more word, organic craft top cut grow operation. So it's kind of like craft beer, okay? <laughs> it's a smaller type of operation. And the reason we like that side is that, that to compete on the, on the biomass side, uh, it's just really going to be difficult for the for the little guy, the small guy, and I and I put myself in that little guy category, the small guy, uh, competing against companies and organizations that have a billion dollars. Oh, we wow. were in Oregon two weeks ago, and uh, we spent a week, and we visited more than a dozen grow operations. And one guy, and he wasn't even considered to be uh, the biggest. He was pretty big, but he had already invested up to the time of harvest this year for just this year's grow over ten million dollars. That's just he, he's a biomass producer. Oh, that's biomass. Yes. Yeah, that's the biomass side. How do you compete with somebody that has enough money to risk to do $10 that. million dollars? Yes. Yeah. But and he's not even considered to be one of the big ones. Oh my. So so the big industry is really going to take over the, the biomass side. Okay. So those and are the people that just, produce for jet fuel and No, all of the those. biomass is just high production CBD oils and isolates and things like that. It's just done on just a mass scale. Oh, it's the, the scale. Is yeah, that what you're saying? It's just done on a mass scale. Yes. The quality isn't there. It's 99% it's is not organic, not even close. Um, it's just a, a different beast. Well, now we, one, one of the things we have here in Hawaii is that uh, beginning this year, there's a bill before the legislature that requires that everybody that's selling CBD has a certificate of purity and authenticity and all of those all beautiful. things. So we oh, need to grow. Music. We need to grow that will fit that bill. So like you're saying, if it's organic, if it begins at that level, then the producers won't have an issue with having certified really good seed. Is that, I hope that's what I'm hearing. In, in the, the big biomass growers, the states, which I hope they do exactly what you just said, they're gonna really have a, have a tough time Mm -hmm. grow organically on large scale. It's just really, really a lot tougher. Well, but we chose the craft pop cut grow operation. I like that uh, phrase. To produce, yes. Yeah, amazingly high, high, high quality. It's clean, it's 
secure, it's beautiful, uh, and you build up a clientele base that trusts your growers, that they're growing the best of the best. Um, that's what, that's our specialty. That's what HGI, Hemp Geo Institute, that's what we specialize in. And we've built 22 of those operations, and we have five under construction as we, as we speak. We, we believe that's longevity. And we have no gray line when it comes to growing organically, you know, growing cure. Our facilities are hygienical facilities. They're very, very clean. And I mean, think about this, you know, this oil you're producing could end up in a mother's four-year-old daughter that has 30, 40 seizures a month and the whole family's desperate for answers. And your oil, they're, they're looking for solutions. They've heard about, you know, cannabinoids and CBD. And, um, why, why would you want to have introduced chemicals into that oil? Right. Um, in, in that scenario, and who knows, maybe the issues were caused by chemicals in the first place. I don't, I don't know. And by the way, that's a real story for the real friend. It is. It is. It yeah, is an so, issue. And but now, her her but daughter you... only has maybe one seizure a month once she's... She's oh, got great. Really good. And this is not the THC. This is strictly the CBD. Oh, no. We're not in the THC business. No, I no. meant for your patient, your, your patient, your friend. Correct. Our it's, whole industry, our whole company, we, we focus on, I mean, legally it has to be in North Carolina and most states around the uh, country, it has to be 0.3 THC or less. So, so. On the industrial hemp site. So we, when we begin with the seed that we know is pure and it doesn't have the THC, so then we begin at a good level. Is that? Yeah, the genetics is a big deal, and it's also a big issue in the industry, in the industrial hemp, because it takes years and years and years and years to, to produce stable genetics. Mm -hmm. And then the other issue, I don't know. If it, there might be some experienced growers on uh, listening, but um, you have what's called a genotype and a phenotype. In a phenotype, if people could, or genotype, G-E-N-O, genotype, gene as in, think of gene as in genetics. That's right. the genetic. And, and you've heard of all different names of, of genetic. Right. Um, that's, that's the genetics. Now, what's the difference between a genotype and a phenotype? Well, a phenotype is the actual genetics plus environment, and that equals phenotype. So, for example, if I brought you these phenotype genetics, these seeds, that work really well in North Carolina environment, they would probably be a disaster in your environment. Oh, and vice, vice versa. Yeah. Well, so, listen, we need to take a break for well, 60 seconds. Okay. And then I want you to explain exactly where you started going with what works in North Carolina and what may or may not work in Hawaii. Okay, we'll be okay. right back. Aloha, my name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanavan. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and we're back. And we're talking to my new best friend. Now, you know I only talk to best <laughs> friends. My new best friend, 
Rick Rainbow. I love that name, Rainbow. Anyway, uh, he is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he has Hemp Geo Institute, and they grow craft organic hemp. Did I get that right? Yeah, we we had you know organic craft top cut, you know, which top cut means the best of the best. The best of the best. Okay. Yeah, the best of the best. Now you were telling beginning to tell us about the different climates and what works and what may or may not work. Yeah, I mean everything begins with the genetics. Uh, it, you know, it's it's garbage in, garbage out, you know, good in, good out. So uh, you could be the best grower in the world, but if your genetics are not uh, great, you're not going to have great outcomes. And so it all begins with the genetics, and and it takes it's going to take a while for the industrial hemp, this industry, uh, and the cannabinoid by the oil side, the CBD side, in order to get what we call the phenotypes, which is the genetics plus the environment. And and it's just going to take a while. And I was mentioning before the break that. Something that works really well in Colorado or Oregon wouldn't work well here in North Carolina with our environment. And the same with you, Marsha, you were saying that even the different islands have different climates. They do, climates. yes. And, yeah. and, and so this industry is new. It's going to, it's beautiful. It's, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, but it's just going to take a, a few years for it to mature. Speaking of mature, how long does it take for one plant to grow? One, if I planted this row of, of hemp today, from today until it's ready for harvesting, how long would that take? Yeah, you know, this industry will drive people nuts because the last question is, and there's never a simple answer. Okay. <laughs> you know? And anybody that's been in it know exactly what I'm talking about, but it could be three months. Uh, we we have genetics that that you can you can grow and harvest within eight nine weeks, or it could be five months. But on average, I think a good one is let's just say three and a half months. Yeah. Four months. Well, we because we have a year round growing season, we don't have frost. Right. So that's beautiful. So that would be about three months, you think? It just depends on on the the, no, I meant, the genotype. But, yeah. Yeah, three to four months. Three yeah. to four months. Yes. Because, like I said, we now with climate change, there's no telling what we're going to get. Yeah. There's just <laughs> different growing philosophies. Some people will, it's just different. It's different. But four months is a pretty good number. Three and a half, four months is a pretty good number on average. Well, now tell me about the rainfall in your area. Um, does, do you get a lot? Do you get cold? Do you get a frost? Anything like that? Well, in North Carolina, yeah, in North Carolina. I mean, today it was in a, in the 60s, so we're pretty we're pretty happy about that. But um, the biggest challenge in North Carolina growing outdoors. Now, our model um, is a combination that we teach our grow operations is indoor, a small indoor genetics operation, a genetics facility with light depth greenhouses. And those two components are working in harmony. They're working together. And growing outdoor for our clients is an option. And we, we tell them that you don't want to depend on the revenue, that uh, potential revenue you can make out, outdoor. If you do make, you know, hit a, hit a good one, uh, it's like, you know, bonus, bonus money. Because you, can never, you just never know based on, based on the weather. We had one of our growers. This year uh, got hit by one tornado and two downbursts. He had he had uh, forty two hundred plants, oh. or about four acres. Oh, he, wiped out a hundred percent of his plants. Wiped oh. them all out. 100%. Oh, oh. He, that means he lost. <laughs> he lost. But but yes, yeah, you lost. did have some pretty bad hurricanes this year. Yeah, we've had hurricanes wipe out farmers and grows, flood the fields, kill the plants. Um, the biggest problem in North Carolina for outdoor growing is the humidity, the heat humidity. You know, it, once it gets into the 90s, I mean, we're living with 90s for four months with high humidity, tropical humidity. And, and so you get mold, you get a lot of mold outdoor. 
And that's why some of the best flour that's coming out of North Carolina is coming from our, our MGO Institute, uh, what we call master growers. We have a master grow program. Um, and it, it, because it's a combination of indoor light depth greenhouse where we can control the environments 100%. I would and think we believe for growing for top cut, high quality, like what we're talking, high quality, beautiful flowers for industrial hemp, um, that a combination of of a genetics facility and light depth greenhouses seems to be the trend across, across it sounds, the country. It sounds safe also from predators. It's, 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 it's real safe. And the biomass people, because of the way that is extracted, that material is extracted, most of the producers don't care if it has mold or not. But, you know, the difference is outdoor, right now there's a glut of, uh, biomass on the market uh, pretty much everywhere, every state that grew it this year. Um, the prices are probably, gosh, today I heard $20 a pound, $40 a pound. Now, when the glut is over, some decent quality will go up around the $40, $50, maybe $60 a pound. But we are getting for our clients, for our top cut, real clean, beautiful. Top cut, we get anywhere from the worst case scenarios, 250, 250 a pound, up to 600 a pound. Wow! For for our growth, so and and not only that, it it's the productivity of of the yield of the oil yield. For example, if you're growing outdoor, uh, most on average, you're going to be looking somewhere between 15 and 30, 35 grams of oil per pound. Our growers growing with a genetics facility and a light depth greenhouse, we are averaging around 80 grams, 80, 90 grams per pound of, of fruit oil. So, so my question to you is how do you, ex or do you just sell the seed or do you actually extract the oil from the seed? Well, the, the oil, now there's hemp seed oil. That's yeah. oil that comes from the seed. So right. when you see hemp oil, that's oil that comes from, from the seed. The cannabinoid oil, the medicinal oil, comes from the flower, uh -huh. the cola, the bud. Okay. So, <laughs> and so what, what I'm asking is, do, do you, as a grower, do you... Take the seed and do you process it? Is what what I was, where I was going with that? No, we grow. We have our genetics. We grow them. We, we grow beautiful flower, beautiful, uh, you know, buds or colas, whatever you want to call them, and and uh, we sell that flower oh. as smokable flower. Oh, or you sell it as it is, and then somebody else extracts the oil. Well, or, well that, that's I, where I'm, the biggest. Craze, when you look around the hundreds of dispensaries just in North Carolina alone, 60% uh, of their sales is from smokable flour. They're selling this just like you'd go into a dispensary in, in Colorado to buy marijuana, in a, you know, little nuggets in a jar. Right. Well, people are buying industrial hemp, THC 0.3 or less. They're not. They're not vaping or smoking this to get high. They're vaping or smoking to get healthy. And in, instead of having it processed into a tincture, some kind of oil product, they're vaping or smoking it. They're just buying the raw flour. The raw thing. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's like they buy marijuana. And that's, that's representing 60, 65% of the dispensary sales is just the flour. And the wholesale to those dispensaries of some decent stuff is all day long at $600. If you have anything even decent quality, you're getting $600 all day long, 600 a pound. And now they retail it. This is the killer right here. They retail at anywhere from $10 to $17 a gram. Oh, my. So let's look at $10. <laughs> let's look at that number. $10 a gram, 454 grams in a pound, 4,500 a pound. So they're paying six. 
and they're they're bringing back into their coffers 4,500. They're netting 3,900 dollars per pound. That's that's the dispensaries net. So you sell to the dispensaries. So our growers, yeah, that we, that's... we have a, a a distribution network that, right. that our growers can sell the flour, and then some of the flours are processed for oil. Well, who does and the processing? Made into the tincture. Yeah, who does the processing for tinctures? Well, there's multiple extraction facilities in in North Carolina and around the country. Do you have extraction facilities right I, now? I don't. In, in I don't Hawaii? know. I, I'm sure we do. I bet. I bet there is. I'm sure we do. Somebody's making. Somebody. It somebody's doing it. But I don't know. See, here the pharmacies have to grow their own uh, THC. That's it is a single from growth to processing to sale. The pharmacy no, has I to do that. it. So that's my question is. Yeah, vertical operation. Yes. That's the trend. That, that's that's that is the ultimate for getting a return on getting into this industry. If you're a grower, you grow it, you process it, you bottle it, and you sell it. Yeah, There's that's, no better way to make more money in this industry than having a vertical integrated type of business. That's, well, that's the bomb. That's the way the law had the pharmacy set up. I meant the dispensary oh, set up. I like it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what they have to do. So consequently they have to hire people at, to to do the grow, you know, and uh from what I understand that once it's grown then it has to go to Deep Hill, which is the lab, to mm -hmm. make sure there's no heavy metals and no oh, yeah. crap in it, you know. Oh, I like, I like that. And then it comes back, and then they can go to the next step and bottle it and sell it, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, most states don't have those type of rigid standards. But they, uh, HGI, we're pushing in North Carolina to, I mean, I never thought, ever in my life that I would actually be working with the government <laughs> to help increase regulations, you know what I mean? And, but I, we are pushing for more regulations here in North Carolina, and it's those type of regulations that you spoke about. It's a beautiful thing. Well, we are just about out of time. However, there's so much more that I want to ask you and so much more to cover. So you will promise me that you'll come back after the first of the year. Oh, let's do it. Okay, great. We could talk for two or three for, hours. Yes, please do. There's so much There's to learn. There's so much to learn, industry. yes. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Aloha. My pleasure. And we'll Bye -bye. see see you next time. Okay.